Okay, I, I will now open the door so all the people okay. can come and hear us. Okay, I will move myself. Okay. Okay. I think they are online. So while uh, we wait uh, just um, a few minutes while people keep coming, first of all, I would like to welcome everybody and wish uh, Happy New Year to the, to the audience. Let's hope that uh, this year will be better than the last one. And uh, welcome to the uh, first uh, session of the MOX Colloquia of uh, 2021. And uh, just a brief uh, introduction to MOX Colloquia, which are the most prestigious, uh, let's say, type of seminar that uh, we organize at MOX, uh, the Laboratory of uh, Modeling and Scientific Computing of Politecnico di Milano, uh, directed by Alfio Quarteroni, that I presume everybody knows. And um, so today we open this uh, session of seminar Unfortunately, uh, virtual seminar, but we hope to come back to the normal conditions soon. Well, we open the session of, uh, let's say, um, seminars with uh, um, Irene Vignon Clementel, Directrice de Recherche at uh, INRIA uh, Paris, in particular in the project RIO about mathematical modeling and numerical simulation of biological flows. The career of Irene really is an example in this field of simulation of biological flows. Indeed, before arriving at INRIA, she uh, worked at Stanford University with the famous Charlie Taylor, and before that, uh, at Cambridge University with Tim Pedley, another, uh, let's say, uh, founder of this, uh, uh, of this field. And uh, the brilliant career of Irene was recently let's say also acknowledged by uh, the uh, grant of uh, uh, ERC, a consolidator grant, which is about, uh, again, the um, numerical modeling of hemodynamics and pharmacokinetics for clinical translation. So Irene, the virtual floor is yours. We are very eager to know about uh, your recent research lines. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo, for this uh, very nice introduction. I am wishing everybody a Happy New Year. And uh, I'm very honored to, to present today some of our work uh, in the last years on patient-specific hemodynamics. So first of all, a little bit of uh, motivation. Um, so we perform multi-level analysis, flow and transport modeling. Uh, first, to understand in uh, congenital heart diseases, so for babies who are born with uh, problems in the heart or in the vessels surrounding the heart, um, how a surgical intervention when there is a restriction in vessels uh, can impact flow distribution and also adaptation downstream of the vasculature. We also try to understand the development of congenital heart diseases through uh, such modeling. Um, flow simulation can also um, be very useful in the design of uh, new devices, and in that regard, uh, techniques such as um, POD can be very useful. Um, and third, regarding respiratory flow and, and transport uh, in diseases, we try to understand how the parenchyma of the lung, when it's altered by a, a disease compared to a, a normal, how it affects the air flow distribution between the different zones in the lung and the transport of, uh, for example, drugs. And um, one thing that we uh, did is to combine uh, machine learning and modeling to, uh, to, to understand, I mean, to localize in a tree where the restrictions uh, are, for example, uh, in asthma. And uh, more recently, we've been uh, looking at um, multi-level image analysis to be able to better understand um, the impact of phenomena that occur at the tissue scale or in the microcirculation interacting with development of cells. Um, so the interaction between this level 
and the uh, macroscopic level, the one that we image with non-invasive imaging. But how do we do this? So I will start with some um, mathematical models of different uh, levels and um, share some um, simulations that are patient specific. So maybe you're aware that we have actually um, about 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels in our body. So we could go around twice, more than twice the earth uh, with all our blood vessels. So we really need uh, like a multi-level approach um, to simulate blood flow in, uh, in vessels. And for this, we can um, use, for example, the Navier-Stokes equations, where u is the velocity and p the pressure, in combination or not uh, with the interaction with the, with the vessel wall. Um, or we can reduce this model by integrating the equations um, in a cross-sectional area uh, of, a, of a tube, of a vessel, uh, to arrive to the so-called 1D equations of blood flow. And um, so conservation of uh, momentum and conservation of mass, like in the Navier-Stokes equation. And if we further integrate in space, we arrive at um, zero D models, so dynamical systems, um, where we have the same physical ingredients. So the resistance uh, to flow due to the viscosity of blood, we find it here, as we found it in the Navier-Stokes equation. And we arrive at an electric uh, analog, in fact, of the circulation where pressure is like voltage and flow rate is like current. So we can use these uh, 3D models in uh, arrays, uh, blood vessels, or we can also have uh, porous media um, 3D models when we want to have detailed features in a localized um, place in the body, in the vessels. But sometimes uh, we only would like, for example, to understand wave propagation, and we, we can then use uh, the 1D models. And since they are less costly, we can use them on more, uh, on more vessels. And finally, the electric anal analogy permits us to, to use these 0D models to model the entire circulation with the, the left and the right heart. Um, the different organs, the lungs, etc., or to um, solve for blood flow and pressure in uh, microvascular networks, for example. Uh, so in a lot more vessels than with 1D and 3D. And um, really the choice of using one model or another really depends on the biomedical question uh, that is at hand. So this is to keep in mind. Now, um, we can, when we look at 3D simulations, so flow and pressure localized to some vessels. So for example, here the um, uh, ascending and descending aorta outside of the heart. These, these vessels are embedded in the rest of the circulation. And so to take into account the, the downstream demand of the blood, uh, we can couple these 3D models or these 1D models with the 0D models. So this is an example of 3D, 0D coupling on the left. Uh, and we can also embed such um, 3D or 1D models into a complete circulation uh, of the, a complete model of the circulation. But then you have parameters, so resistances, capacitances for the, uh, elasticity of the wall or uh, inductances for the inertia of the blood. All these are parameters that you need to set up. So the question is then, how do you set up these um, parameters? Well, you, we, we try to choose them um, based on patient-specific measurements. And for this, we take as many measurements as um, we, we have access to. So usually they are heterogeneous. So besides uh, imaging that can give us the um, geometrical model of the vessels, we can, for example, use ultrasound to get um, 
to Doppler ultrasound to get maximum and mean or mean velocities uh, over time in a cross-section area of a vessel. And from this, try to recover the flow rates over time. So how much blood goes um, through a vessel. We can also use uh, PCMRI, which is another imaging technology to get the flow rate uh, over time. And for pressure, uh, catheterization uh, with a catheter that is inserted into several locations of the body can give us some pressure over several cardiac cycles. So depending on the acquisition, we trust only mean values of these uh, quantities, or sometimes we have access to only the minimum and the maximum over the cardiac cycle, uh, or the full-time varying curves. So this will dictate a bit the approach of the um, tuning of the parameters to these measurements. So the, the zero D parameter estimation strategies that uh, we have is to estimate, for example, the equivalent resistance of the whole system. So provided we have measurements or uh, of uh, the pressure loss over the entire system and uh, how much blood um, goes through that system. Then we can run a first 3D simulation and compare the 3D resistance uh, to this uh, equivalent resistance. And then decide if the 3D resistance is really negligible compared to the overall resistance of the system. Um, then we can do as if the 3D part is not there. And more or less, um, we have all the outlets of the vessels uh, in, in parallel and we can uh, use a purely zero D model to, to do the parameter inference. Or the 3D part really is not so negligible. And uh, then uh, other methods uh, need to, to be used um, because multi-scale models will be much more expensive to, to run. And depending on the available data, um, um, for example, mean, max, or average uh, pressures, or if you have a time tracing, which is much richer information, then um, uh, we don't use the same um, approach to estimate the parameters. So the strategy should be devised according to the avail available measurements. And um, this means their implementation and computational complexity need to be coherent with the amount of uh, information we have. Um, and will be, so as I said, purely done on purely zero D models. Um, and for multi-scale models, we can either use uh, loosely coupled 3D zero D models, where only a few um, 3D zero D simulation are required. And this is a cheap um, approach which is fine in our experience when the, 3D, the flow in the 3D part is not too complex. So you can run, for example, the first uh, 3D zero D simulation, then do um, compute the equivalent zero D parameters. So the black one here that, that uh, model the 3D part. And then on this purely zero D model, you can estimate uh, the distal parameters, uh, for example, using the uncertain common filter method. Once the distal parameters um, are inferred, so the orange one, then we can go back to the 3D 0D simulation and do a few iterations until convergence. So in, in our experience, this, this works uh, quite efficiently. And sometimes, though, you have to if the 3D part is uh, really critical, um, you have to do strongly coupled 3D 0D um, model parameter inference. And this is much more uh, expensive. And there are um, a lot of groups that have uh, proposed some strategies to, um, to make it more takeable. So for those that are not very familiar with the uh, Kamen filter approach, um, I'm going to just briefly explain what it is. So 
what we want to do is to um, what we are starting from sorry is a is a, a model that relates um, some parameters initial conditions um, and some uh, forcing condition to an output which is the state of the model so here we have in our case these are dynamical models um, where the u here is our not really boundary condition but uh, forcing uh, condition so the forward problem is that given some uh, parameters so here are some uh, resistances and capacitances um, in uh, series and parallel so this is the simplest model of this uh, circulation the Winkelson model so given these three parameters for example um, and the flow rate I can compute the pressure um, but now if I have a measurement of that pressure which has some noise in it I can do the inverse problem and given this measurement estimate my parameters so uh, H, I can construct uh, here uh, this function Z of T that um, takes into account the observation of my part of my state, plus take into account the noise in the measurement. And then the common filter approach is uh, is just to uh, based on a construction of an estimator of my state through uh, so the dynamics of this. Um, uh, estimator has two parts, the model part and the filter part, which takes into account the deviation of my state uh, compared to the measurement I have access to. So now, uh, assuming, uh, I mean, treating the parameters as part of the state, um, what's, uh, how does it work? So we start from some initial state and with different uh, uh, parameter values. Then we propagate uh, the states with the model. We compute the empirical average and covariance of the of the state. So this gives us a forward state, and then we can compare this um, quantity to our observation and maybe correct for it. So we get a new state and covariance. From there. Uh, we compute new uh, sampling to test and vice versa. So over time, we uh, our state, but uh, more importantly, our parameters um, are converging um, to some values based on the measurements that we give, based on the measurement and the model. So essentially, it's a predictor corrector method where we have to make a compromise between the confidence in uh, prior knowledge and um, the confidence in the measurement. So then why are these uh, simulations uh, useful? Well, I will uh, show you now an example that I particularly uh, like because it uh, allows to pose what if questions, or for example, to allow clinicians to ask us what if questions. So on the, I'm taking an example here of a congenital heart disease. So a case where contrarily to normal, um, the, the left ventricle, the left pump is not uh, working. So only the right side of the heart is uh, working well. So it's, it's called single ventricle uh, physiology. And there are a number of surgeries that are done to these kids so that they can survive. So um, we had access to do some surgery planning to a number of data. And so uh, in this uh, schematic, the green, uh, the, the blue part, the sorry, the red parts are the quantities that we had uh, for measurements that we used to, to tune our model. Whereas the green uh, quantities were used for validation of the model. So we had that for the close to the heart, the lungs, the upper body, and the lower body of the, of the child. And now for one child, so uh, I'm showing you for several quantities. So the uh, volume, for example, uh, 
of the left ventricle over two cardiac cycle, how it evolves over time, uh, the flow across the, some important valve, for example. And now in red are the measurements that were used to, to tune the model. So you see they're fitting quite well in general. Um, and in particular, the valve dynamics is better captured. Uh, it's pretty well captured compared to the measurement here. Um, and this is because we, well, we, we used a, a certain uh, valve uh, model that we proposed. Um, and here you see the validation curve. So you see that uh, uh, the, this case, um, our model is, is well validated. We also took into account uh, data at different heart rates and developed some uh, um, methods for that. So I'm showing a second example where um, there was even uh, some reg regurgitation in a valve, which is uh, uh, should not be. I mean, flow is going backward at some point where it should not. Um, and you can see that, again, uh, we fit quite well the measurements and that um, the validation is quite good for the pressure in the ventricle. And also um, the model results were consistent with the uh, electrocardiogram measurements and also um, with different quantities that could be uh, acquired by imaging. So now um, the interesting part was that, um, th so we were before the, the, the second surgery in, in, for that child. And in general, uh, the clinicians uh, are wondering for this kind of, of children where they have this uh, problem in the left ventricle and a leaky, a leaky valve, so a valve that doesn't close properly. Should they operate the valve uh, as soon as possible, or can they wait for the stage two surgery to, to operate on it as well? So to understand that um, in, the, in the model, we could uh, induce, in fact, a regurgitation, uh, for example, with the first patient when there is not any regurgitation. So as we increase the degree of regurgitation, you can see that the so-called pressure volume uh, loop of the, of the ventricle is changing. What we note is that the stroke volume, so the volume uh, pumped uh, by the heart is um, increasing with increasing regurgitation and the pressure that is perfusing the different organs is decreasing. Now the surgery, the second uh, surgery has the opposite effect. It's reducing the stroke volume and increasing the perfusion pressure. Um, so, hence the question, what happens when we put two effects uh, together? What, what wins? Um, should the clinician do the repair or not at all? Uh, and if so, uh, when should they repair it? So we did some um, simulation with uh, only one problem or both problem combined. And as you can see, in fact, the, the answer is that when you have regurgitation, the surgery does reduce a little bit the stroke volume and increases a little bit the perfusion pressure, but not much. But in any case, the result is that whatever the, uh, the regurgitation fraction, this fraction always increases with the surgery. Not much. Um, of course, if the regurgitation fraction uh, before the surgery uh, was small to begin with. So this modeling um, enabled uh, to answer together by discussing with the clinician that for uh, low regurgitation, the recommendation would be to do the repair of the valve at the same time as the second uh, surgery or not to repair it in fact to allow it to grow naturally. Where, whereas for high regurgitation, um, maybe it's uh, safer to do it before the surgery. And so what the model um, also allows us to access is what's happening for the atrium. 
uh, we could reproduce, in fact, the, the well-known um, V-loop part, um, uh, thanks to an addition in the, in the model, which is this V-loop is, is known in the clinical literature to increase uh, with increased uh, regurgitation. And uh, we studied two types of uh, different regurgitation. And here, um, the clinician thought that, um, yeah, that so the surgery would decrease this, uh, this V loop. So it would also have a counter uh, uh, effect for the atrium, as we had seen for the ventricle. But in fact, it's not, uh, the model suggests that it's not the case. And, uh, and that even if it, it's making the, the it, well, the model suggests that the, the fibers of the atrium are even working uh, non, uh, non-efficiently um, um, in, the, in, uh, in that case. So this was an example to show you um, how a model can help to better understand um, how a disease and a treatment interact with each other. Now we can also use simulations to replace an invasive test for treatment planning. And this is work in collaboration with uh, the company Heartflow, <clears throat> uh, which has been developing a product to um, replace by simulation an invasive test. And the context is the one of coronary artery disease, so uh, progressive um, restriction of the lumen of a blood vessel um, and formation of the so-called stenosis. So at some point, the bloods cannot flow anymore through the vessels that are feeding the heart muscle. So as the disease progresses, um, the, it has a higher functional impact, which is putting the, the patient at, at more risk. And also um, the way to detect it is uh, more and more, um, I mean, is through different kinds of, uh, uh, of tests and imaging. And um, so that are more and more, uh, let's say, uh, expensive to do. And the treatment is also more expensive. So, the goal is to catch the patients when um, they are still at, at uh, low risk with um, as little information as possible. So diagnostic tools for, for CAD are typically uh, coming out of a, a CT, which gives an anatomical information and combined with a physiological model, so a CFD approach, a so-called FFR CT, can uh, identify if the lesions are significantly uh, are significant uh, or not from a functional point of view. So this is just on the larger vessels. On the other hand, uh, there are also uh, there is also perfusion imaging, which by um, which um, typically helps us to identify myocardium regions, so regions in the, in the heart muscle, where there is a perfusion deficit, uh, usually at stress. So for example, like here compared to rest. And this is another information more uh, at the perfusion level of the, of the organ. So the question is, can we bridge the gap between what's going on in the larger vessels and, what, and what's going on in the, in the tissue? Um, by combining an approach where we have the microcirculation and also the micro microcirculation taken into account. So for this, and in order to, to bridge the gap between these two um, modalities of uh, lesion assessment, we propose a, a pipeline that starts from a, a, a standard CT and uh, computes the FFR, which I'm going to explain a bit further afterwards, and uh, also predicts the perfusion imaging. 
So the first step we had to do is um, is to introduce a model to go beyond the the vessels that uh, we have accessed by imaging, which are the larger vessels here. Um, so here we use the constrained constructive optimization approach, uh, where by an angiogenesis algorithm, we could grow some um, uh, different uh, trees that are uh, growing at uh, from the different existing uh, outlets into the myocardium of the patient. Um, and it's relying on functional principles. So it's a patient-specific uh, algorithm that respects the myocardium geometry and correlates uh, um, with segmented network and extend from several outlets at the same time, which is a really here a challenge because the different trees can interpenetrate each other into a non-convex uh, territory. So here are examples with 6,000 terminal segments where we pushed it to also 12,000 um, with an approach where we first have vessels on the, laying on the surface of the myocardium. And it showed uh, quite good uh, reputability and uh, robustness characteristics. Now, in terms of hemodynamics, so the coronary model uh, is based on a steady uh, hemodynamics model that I presented uh, at the beginning, where there is a total resting target flow, which is estimated based on the on the myocardium mass, and um, at the inlet. Uh, the aortic pressure is prescribed, and at the outlet, uh, flow boundary conditions are, are prescribed, but that are uh, tuned based on target resistances, for which there is a finite vasodilation capacity, both of the synthetic vessels and of the, yeah, so uh, to accommodate the target flow, we can uh, uh, vasodilate the synthetic vessels uh, or change also the downstream resistance up to a, down to a factor of four. Now we simulate um, conditions in at rest and under stress uh, where we don't impose the flow in that case, but it's the, the, the stress flow comes from a maximum vasodilation that uh, occurs everywhere. And the final output uh, under stress is this, is this the so-called FFRCT, which is uh, just the pressure at a given location divided by the inlet pressure. And the clinically, clinically um, accepted criteria for the cutoff of a significant lesion is uh, 0 0.8. So here it's an example of a disease patient for which um, we have a, a FFR, which is below that value here. Now for the myocardium model, uh, we use a, a porous medium approach, so based on Darcy's law where um, omega is the velocity and P the pressure. And flow can get in and out through these uh, condensates um, uh, here. And all the parameters are considered homogeneous and isotropic. And the final output is the myocardial blood flow. So it's the, in a certain region, um, it's the flow divided by the volume of that region. Now to, to couple the two models, uh, we use an iterative coupling approach where at the outlet of each, um, at the outlet, um, uh, at the end of uh, the different trees here, we can compute a, a, a pressure from the coronary model. And this in turn is the source pressure in the Darcy model, which uh, when solved, gives us uh, a flow um, related to that outlet, which then is a bond recognition for the coronary model and vice versa. So we can do the coupling until convergence. Um, and yeah. So 
the last output is the perfusion map conversion because um, um, the clinical data we have access to is, is like this. It's a 2D map, so, uh, which is structured into uh, 17, uh, 17 regions corresponding to different parts of the myocardium. In fact, the myocardium is divided into three in the uh, longitudinal uh, direction and then radially into different uh, segments. And each time uh, an average is made going from the, the center of the heart endocardium to the epicardium. So hence this shape, which has 17, uh, 17 different segments. So it's as if we would like crush the myocardium into a, a map like this. And this is what the clinicians look at. So results, so um, a first uh, cohort study. So we had five patients with non-obstructive CAD and one patient with severe LAD re uh, lesion. Um, so you see here that in the epicardial vessel, the FFR is fine, whereas here it's, uh, it's too low. Um, for the non-obstructive CAD patients at rest, the coronary model alone or the coupled uh, model results are, are here. And you see that the coronary model, uh, so without the coupling, gives a very heterogeneous um, MBF, which is not what is expected from the literature and what is not what we see uh, in the imaging exam of the patient. In fact, when we look at uh, the MBF in the six, uh, 17 different regions for five patients and compare the coronary model to the couple model and both to the measurements, we can see that the couple model uh, always does better in terms of um, uh, dispersion. The average flow though is, uh, the average MBF is, uh, is correct by, a bit by design. So this is for resting condition, but what about the stress condition, which is uh, what clinician looks uh, look at preferentially? We see here too that the couple model uh, does pretty well in terms of um, both um, the average MBF and also the dispersion uh, among the different uh, um, AHA segments. When we look more finely into the maps, we see that, uh, so just for the couple model, so this on the left simulations, on the right, uh, the patient exams, we see that overall there is a good agreement, even if uh, sometimes we do not have a very good agreement, in particular for patient five, for which we predict an obstruction, um, I mean, a perfusion deficit. Uh, whereas there is none uh, in the patients. And we think that we have to, to improve our vascular, synthetic vascular generation model. Now for the severe CAD patients, um, in fact, we could not um, predict the correct level. We predicted a too high um, um, stress flow. So we use the, the overall um, flow from the PET exam to uh, for this simulation. And we see that we predict pretty well uh, the, the perfusion deficit. In fact, even when we use the, the higher flow, the, what comes naturally out of the model, we also predicted this region as being uh, with a perfusion deficit. So summary for that part. Um, okay, it's just the beginning of some work. Uh, we have to do much more uh, uh, so that this can be really applicable to a lot of, of patients. But it seems that uh, the framework that we propose for simulating blood flow in coronary uh, arteries and the myocardium works quite well, just based on a simple scan. We have agreement for with the, the, the perfusion imaging data for four out of five patients with non-obstructive CAD. Um, and the last patient, the disease patient, um, shows that we have the model has the ability to detect myocardial regions with perfusion deficits downstream of an impaired um, vessel, for example. And um, but we can also um, 
um, try to, 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 to predict not only what's happening right now, but how a disease can progress. And uh, this is not necessarily um, just feasible by pure, um, let's say, bio biophysical modeling, um, but combining machine learning with biophysical uh, modeling can, can help to do that. So this is the last part of my talk on a, uh, another acquired aortic disease. But this time, that is not on a restriction of a vessel, but on an enlargement of a vessel. So it's called an abdominal aortic aneurysm, which is a localized expansion here of the descending aorta, which is usually uh, does not present any symptoms. Um, but when it ruptures, there is a very high mortality. And in fact, the prevalence is quite high in the population um, with uh, risk factors that uh, that um, can explain um, uh, the development um, of, of such aneurysm on a static, statistical basis. Um, and in any case, there is a treatment which is ideally only for high-risk patients, either by putting a, a stent uh, graft inside the aneurysm uh, uh, vessel or uh, by open surgery by removing uh, that part. So the question is, can we predict um, this abdominal aortic aneurysm growth? So about the, the, the growth, um, some, some processes of uh, development are known, but everything is not understood uh, yet. What is uh, understood is that probably there is a shift of uh, um, Elastin to collision ratio, so how the, the vessel wall uh, is, um, is characterized, and a mechano uh, adaptation related to it. So, if there is um, more elastin, then the wall will uh, enlarge a little bit. And this, in turn, uh, changes the flow, the transport topology, the <clears throat> Wall shear stress, which is the force sensed um, by the cells, the endothelial cells on the vessel lumen. And this in turn uh, promotes the, the growth of what is called the intraluminal thrombus, uh, which is like um, some kind of um, um, smushy structure that is um, uh, developing and um, little by little can. Uh, take more and more space, as you can see here, uh, especially for this second patient for which we had three scans over, um, yeah, over ab about one year. And here you can see how the lumen of the vessel uh, changes a little bit, but more importantly, this intraluminal uh, thrombus in, in gray is really uh, growing more and more. The development of this thrombus is, uh, is um, um, related to some flow alteration properties. So typically uh, high shear zone and lower shear zones. And in turns, uh, when the thrombus uh, covers the, the vessel wall, this promotes the arterial cell hypoxia and inflammation. So this promotes wall degradation. And so we have a, a vicious circle here. So the second um, um, question we wanted to address is, can we identify a correlation between flow alteration and aneurysm growth? So how did we address this question? So we started from 138 scans. So we had nine controls and uh, 32 patients with three different scans over time. Uh, we did a lot of um, um, like shape analysis. So by first uh, segmenting the lumen and also the intraluminal uh, thrombus part. Then we run some um, 3D um, percentile, 3D, 0D uh, percentile simulation with non Newtonian model, um, which uh, we could uh, 
shown a few patients uh, had uh, uh, good validation in terms of flow at certain uh, location. And in terms of post-processing, we looked at global quantities, such as like, for example, the volume of the, of the thrombus or local quantities that are um, patch-wise. So for this, the center line of the vessel was, um, uh, was constructed. And then we, we constructed little um, patches, little um, uh, rectangle on the walls where we computed uh, a number of quantities. So for example, we looked at if there was, uh, if the thickness of the thrombus was high or not, um, if there was thrombus, uh, the distance to the center line, and then several hemodynamics quantities related to, to shear and development of platelets, um, development of thrombus. So first, based on all this data, um, we did some simple uh, statistical analysis to, to test to test which metrics are associated with uh, being normal, being controlled, or being uh, aneurysm patient with either being high risk based on the diameter and growth uh, criteria, or being low risk. And these criteria are given by clinicians. And over time, there is um, the tagging of a patient going from uh, low risk to high risk is irreversible. And we did find a number of, um, of metrics that could clearly statistically uh, differentiate, between, differentiate between these three groups. So then we decided to, to try to understand uh, if morphological and hemodynamical um, um, quantities locally, so on every patch, could give some uh, correlation that would explain the, the growth of the aneurysm. And in fact, what we found is that um, for some patients, we could find a very nice uh, correlation between, for example, the distance to the center line for each little patch uh, and um, a hemodynamic here, ECAP um, quantity. But for other patients, the, uh, the correlation was really, really bad. Even if we use uh, uh, yeah, and for this, we use uh, boost, bootstrapping uh, techniques, um, which is important here. So we did that for all, uh, all patients. And for each patient, we, we could compute uh, so the goodness of the, uh, um, of the correlations, which is given here by the, the Spearman's row um, value, which if it's close to zero, means there is no correlation, basically. And you can see that uh, for the distance to the center line, for example, the correlation with uh, uh, Walsh stress, Walsh stress, um, or Walsh stress gradient uh, is negative and, and, and quite good, um, rather positive for RRT and ECAP. But every time we have quite a wide range. Uh, spread of, uh, of these spearman's uh, coefficient. And for ILT thickness, it's all over the place. So overall, what we conclude is that we could not really find like a general law uh, that would explain the, the growth uh, of aneurysm between morphological quantities and uh, hemodynamical quantities. Nevertheless, we, we know they are related and this is why um, we decided to have a machine learning approach, namely to, to build a classifier that would um, predict the, the change of risk of a given patient. So I remind you, uh, for these patients, we have the definition of high risk, um, which is a bit different for, for uh, men and women, actually, based on the... Um, clinically define uh, maximum diameter of the aneurysm or uh, its growth over time. If a patient is not in, under high risk, then it is considered low risk. So here, um, yeah, the goal is really to, to predict 
the risk change from low risk to high risk or if the patient is going to to keep being at low risk for example based on current data at time tn so for this we used all the data that we had generated uh, before doing some feature selection with um, principal component analysis to generate some features vector and then uh, we split the, the the set uh, so we had pairs of uh, features vector as input and the output is the the risk for a certain scan being low or high risk and um, so part of the data was then used as learning set using a neural network, uh, which is here a multi-layer uh, perceptron. So then we built the classifier like this, and then we evaluated it with um, another part of the, of the data set, and we repeated it um, uh, several times. So the results are the following. If you use the current clinical metric, you can uh, see that um, uh, if you use a rock analysis, which is a typical uh, uh, diagram where you have true positive rate versus false positive uh, rate, and which an ideal uh, model is uh, going from zero, zero to very rapidly uh, one for the true positive rate, so the ideal model is uh, like this. Um, so ideally, your area under the curve is basically uh, one. It covers the, the, whole, uh, the whole graph. Here you see that um, if you only use the cl current clinical metric, you have an area under the curve, which is of 0.75. And uh, this is what actually was reported in the, in the literature. Now we use different uh, feature sets to see if we can do better than this. So if we use only clinical metrics, but not the DMAX, actually uh, morphological metrics uh, only, hemodynamics metrics only, or a combination of all, we got different results. In fact, clinical features only, um, they don't do better than uh, the DMAX. When we use morphological features only, we have a jump into the predictability. So the area under the curve is jumping to uh, 0 0.93, almost the same, a little bit better for hemodynamics features. And if we combine everything, um, we got even uh, up to 0 0.98. So statistical um, analysis of these different results give that, in fact, the, the classifiers uh, for the three last sets, so morphological, hemodynamical, or everything combined, are statistically different uh, than the, the current metric or using only uh, clinical information. So this really um, uh, gives maybe a new way to, to, to predict uh, the growth of uh, an aneurysm based on the combination of modeling and, um, uh, and machine learning. So in conclusion, overall, um, I hope I've shown you that modeling and numerical methods um, have mature for patient-specific simulation, and that hemodynamic simulation can help to understand a system, a disease, or a treatment to predict uh, or plan an intervention for a specific patient or to test new treatment ideas of, uh, of clinicians. And that, yes, a combination of machine learning and, and uh, modeling can, um, can be complementary to palliate the lack of uh, mechanistic equations for the moment here about growth uh, and maybe to give some hints in which direction to create new models. So we have made uh, great progress in terms of these tools, but validation uh, remains an issue. And really, uh, we need to still make more impact on patients because these methodologies uh, uh, have, in general, not been applied to uh, in the clinical setting. So uh, thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions.
thank you very much, Irene, for the very interesting seminars and for the, let's say, inspiring conclusions. Uh, uh, any question from the audience? Please, Christian. Thanks, Irene. Thanks for this very uh, great and inspiring uh, talk. I would like to, to have uh, a question, a curiosity about the second part. As you know very well, we are with Alfio, Paolo, and Simone. They are also dealing with the problem of perfusion, modeling perfusion, and to estimate the maps. And so the problem we, we, we we have now is how to calibrate, of course, patient-specific parameters. So I would like to, to, to understand if you started with this uh, issue and if yes, if you could uh, provide some uh, details. Uh, in particular, you have beta in the coupling condition and the K, the permeability in the DRC model. So I would like to understand if this beta and K are uh, a constant or depend on space, as I suppose, and how um, are you calibrating them? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, I have to admit, I find it difficult to give a talk without seeing people. <laughs> I realize that uh, I'm a human being, and uh, so I'm sorry if I was a bit slow uh, at some moments. <laughs> but in any case, so to answer your question, um, so yeah, it's uh, so the. Um, so the permeability and the conductances, uh, so K and beta parameters, they are uh, homogeneous and isotropic, okay? Um, but, uh, and the permeability is uh, for now uh, constant. Um, so it's not patient specific. And in fact, we varied this by, uh, I think, uh, two or three, orders of magnitude and it didn't really change the perfusion results um, significantly. Now the beta, yeah, it's true that uh, I didn't have time to present that. So uh, in fact, they are, so they are still homogeneous, uh, but they are patient specific because they are computed based on the, on the Cornei model uh, results. Um, but essentially they, uh, the, the value of, of beta is, um, uh, in fact, depends on the, the pressure loss that you have in the epicardial uh, vessels and also in the synthetic network and uh, how much flow you manage to, to push through the, the coronary model. Um, if you want the details, I can detail that afterwards or in the paper, but... Uh, but uh, thank you yeah maybe philosophically like i mean our first tendency was to say okay we can parameterize in space the beta for example based on the perfusion map at at rest that's completely possible i mean this is uh, what you guys are doing right um the problem is that um, um our clinicians didn't think that the heterogeneity that we are seeing at rest when we see some heterogeneity is really real. Um, so they have medium confidence into, you know, the spatial uh, map results uh, at rest. And if we want to really predict something for stress, then we don't want to use the information of this uh, imaging, so. Of course. Thank you. Paolo, I have a question, if I can. Ah, Giancarlo. <laughs> Hi, Irene, how are you? <laughs> Congratulations for the grant first. Thank you. And uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm uh, different from the question from Christian that is a uh, mathematician. I have uh, a question in, uh, in the biomechanical field. I think I, I, I am referring to the, the second example that you presented. In particular, I, I saw that uh, there is a clear mismatch in patient five in terms of patient. Ah, yes. yes, and uh, I was wondering if, if uh, in your uh, um, model, 
that you adopted to uh, create uh, the coronary trees uh, in the downstream part where you cannot use the images, uh, you take you mm, you take into account also for possible collaterals. Because as you know, when you have stenosis, I mean, not physiological uh, conditions, but pathological ones, uh, in many cases, also in congenital heart, we, see the, we saw the same. You can have some collaterals uh, bypass uh, that uh, can connect uh, different areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so maybe this can, uh, could explain uh, the so strong difference that you observed. Uh, maybe there are some interconnection between different uh, regions of the heart. So. Uh, your, um, because I understood that uh, you are using a sort of uh, angiogenetic, uh, angiogenesis model, mm -hmm. but uh, I assume that you are not including um, possible collaterals. Isn't yes, it? so thank you for the question. So first of all, um, as you can see here, even in terms of like overall uh, flow prediction for that patient, we are completely off. I mean, this patient has a, a stress flow that is much higher than uh, than the other ones. Yeah, the other ones. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, our model doesn't allow to have because um, yeah, our model does not allow to have such a jump uh, from rest to stress in terms of um, of uh, on flow. Okay. Because by design. Uh, what we found in the literature is that the vasodilation can uh, decrease the uh, microvascular resistance down by a factor of four only and not like you know more than this whereas here we go from one to uh, over five so this means it's uh, the, the factor is more than four right so that was the that's the first issue for for this patient but even if we um, we also run a simulation, you know, targeting such a high flow uh, to be pushed in the system. And of course, it's even worse because we have a flow deficit that it's not even worse, actually, but uh, because there is a nonlinear effect, but uh, there, um, and there is a bit of a redistribution effect. But nevertheless, we still predict a perfusion deficit in a zone where it shouldn't be. Um, so we ask ourselves the same question as you, but maybe Buongiorno. Buongiorno has a collaterals. And so we, we ask the clinicians to, to see in the uh, angiography uh, images if they could see any collateral uh, vessels. And so they looked carefully and um, they told us, no, these patients, no. I mean, okay. it's pretty healthy because look, I mean, it can, uh, at stress has, uh, can have quite high flow, in fact. Uh, we don't see any collaterals in, in the angel, so we don't think they're, they're collateral. Yeah. So, but we, when we looked more at the, uh, at the tree that we generated in, in that zone, Ma parla in italiano. we think that uh, maybe there are some, um, uh, I mean, this, this uh, patient has very uh, tortuous vessels, actually. Um, and so there are side branches that we, that we add in the model to construct the synthetic uh, branches. But maybe uh, they, are, they are not um, as, as they should be. So bottom line, probably we need to improve uh, our vascular generation uh, mechanism. OK, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, there was some disruption. In the Italy's that is twice, too, too, too much big. We, in this moment, sono dei trolls. the level of that is one up. But it's not, it's not easy to manage that. Sorry. For the first yeah. time in 2015, we stopped the crew. Yeah, yeah. We, we have trolls uh, inside the, uh, inside the conference. Yeah. So there are more questions, and I would like to give the participants the opportunity to ask. There was a question from. Uh, uh, 
Um, sorry, now I don't just just give me a second. Uh, Ivan, Ivan Fumagalli. Ivan Fumagalli, and one bit before from uh, uh, Francesco Rossi. So if Ivan and Francesco are still there, please feel free to ask the question. Okay, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, uh, first of all, Professor Vignon Clement, for uh, your inspiring talk uh, and a very broad, uh, actually, talk. My question is about the macro regurgitation program that you addressed. And uh, um, I was wondering what kind of data do you use to um, quantify, let's say, the regurgitation and uh, how you use it in uh, your uh, ZOD model. And uh, uh, then, uh, if you noticed uh, any difference in the clinical outcome that you can of obtain from your model with respect to the um, outcomes uh, that uh, are based on, let's say, clinical evidence and those, those, those uh, data that are used uh, by surgeon uh, uh, on, on the clinical practice, let's say. Um, so this is a this work was joint work with Giancarlo, actually, so maybe he'll have a complimentary answer. But um, so here, for example, it's a, a ultrasound of the match of valve. So you see, I mean, uh, of the regurgitant valve. So you, you you see the typical pattern where you have also negative, uh, I mean, negative flow. Um, so that's one way uh, to, to see this regurgitation. And, um, uh, but in this example, it was really more like, a, a, I mean, not theoretical question because it's a very practical question about what they should do. But uh, see, we wanted to, to, to simulate different um, percentages of regurgitation and, and see how the surgery was, you know, compensating or not for it. Um, so in, for that example, uh, we didn't have like validating data uh, for what we were um, um, seeing. Nevertheless, um, um, for example, this uh, VLOOP that is getting uh, larger uh, with increased regurgitation, this is something that actually was reported in literature. So this is something that we can reproduce. Uh, and by the way, the addition in the model of this uh, part that allows to have the, the VLOOP comes from uh, Giancarlo. Um, and um, yeah, and, and these results, for example, like we have no idea if they are true or not. So that's for that topic. Now for the <coughs> parameter estimation I was um, talking about for the patient with regurgitation. Uh, so maybe I should move this somewhere else. Maybe I do that. Okay. Um, so actually, so your question was purely on the regurgitation aspect. Uh, um, Irene, if you want, I can add uh, a few details on the valvular model. <laughs> Just to yeah, uh, just to answer the question first. So yeah. the, the the red curves here are are the curves that we use to train the model, and the the green um, curves or or quantities here are what we use to validate uh, the model. So you see that the what we had access to were basically pressures and flows uh, in different parts around the heart. Um, whereas for validation, we had this pressure in the left ventricle and uh, some, uh, yeah, Doppler, Doppler across the valve. So similar to what I've shown uh, before uh, and wall volume in, uh, in MRI, uh, from MRI data. And yeah, Giancarlo, sure, please. Uh... Yeah, just, uh, just a few additional comments uh, about the valvular model. This is a, a, a pure uh, lamper parameter model, not just for the hemodynamics, I mean, resistance, inheritance, and so on, but also for some structural part. So we tried to have uh, for the, both for the ventricle and the atria, a description of the myocardial contraction, uh, contraction 
and the elastances uh, by using uh, some models taken from the literature and the same for the valves there are some, we modified some okay. models uh, where they uh, took into account uh, for the stiffness of the leaflet uh, for the inertia of the blood flow and the, they modeled the two different kind of uh, valvular regurgitation one uh, due to a prolapse of the leaflet that me and uh, another one due to an excessive enlargement of the of the orifice and so somehow you can uh, there are a few parameters that you can tune or you can identify in order to have uh, the, the the proper regurgitation obviously these parameters uh, uh, will affect also the the, the global results in terms of uh, volumes of the cardiac chambers and so on so at the end the, the you, you can identify also these parameters in the global process or the identifications that uh, you can do yeah the new models are in this publication thank you very much to both mm. are there other questions or comments for irene otherwise Let's say I will just close the seminar here, but it doesn't mean we have to leave. Uh, let's maybe consider that uh, the time of, so first of all, let's thank Irene, Irene, Irene for the nice seminar and for, uh, let's say, um, let's say for this uh, interesting discussion after that. And uh, of course, at this moment we, shall give you a, a virtual applause and uh, some more thanks. And uh, so for, for, for those who are still interested in, uh, in uh, let's say, discussing with Irene as we were in a seminar room, please feel free to stay and to continue this uh, uh, discussion. Like Giancarlo just did. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Irene, I have a, uh, I have a question mm -hmm. uh, or about, uh, let's say, a, a very general one that comes from your conclusions and uh, for, let's say, just uh, taking a look at your, uh, let's say, at the abstract, at the main lines of your recent ERC grant. So, of course, you say, and I, I, I completely agree, that there is still a lot of work to do to, let's say, uh, for the integration between the models and the clinics, even though this work about, uh, I mean, even computational hemodynamics, but it's through many other fields has started, let's say almost, I, I don't know, I just uh, say a number about 40 years ago, which is mm -hmm. a lot. There is not yet, uh, let's say a really true integration between the, um, the uh, outcome of the simulations and the practice in the clinics. So, uh, and my impression is that, I mean, the model has been improving and growing a lot in all sense, in, in, in all, let's say, directions, in the physical accuracy, in the computational, let's say, capabilities, but still it doesn't make this integration really uh, uh, work well. So in your opinion, what do we need? Do we need, uh, simpler model? Do we need faster models? Do you need something else? So can you just uh, uh, share your impressions about this? Yeah, it's uh, thank you for the question because it's really um, the question I asked myself before applying to the ERC. To be honest, I was like, yeah, I was a bit frustrated by that point. You know, it's not advancing enough and I was questioning, you know, the value of, of, you know, of my work. I was like, well, what I'm interested in is really to, you know, to make a difference with modeling uh, uh, in medicine. So if it's not happening, then, you know, <laughs> um, is it, uh, you know, maybe there are better ways to help society, you know, like, um, so it's a real question for me. And um, I think part of the problem is that um, 
to bring these models to the clinics requires uh, other competencies than the ones that are required to, to develop a mathematical model, to develop a good numerical uh, method, to apply these methods correctly uh, in the context of the biomedical setting, to understand the clinical data. I mean, all these are kind of, you know, diff different competencies and um, usually when you are, um, let's say, tagged as a numeration uh, or, you know, if you go to the application a lot, you're not, you're, that type of work is not considered research anymore in a way. Um, so the, you know, you cannot do everything at the same time. You cannot uh, advance numerical method and at the same time uh, bring it to the clinics. You, it, it takes a lot of energy to, to do both. So, so there is a bit of, um, I think, of um, conceptual uh, problem here of, of expertise and also of how uh, research is, uh, I mean, is evaluated by peers, let's say. Uh, especially for younger, I'm thinking more for, you know, younger uh, PhDs or, or postdocs. Um, and so that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, uh, yeah, and on the other hand, the clinicians um, in hospitals, they don't really have time nor the uh, competencies usually to, to, to take our models and bring them to, to the clinics, right? So there is a, a gap to, to feel by uh, little by little. And in my experience, what seems to, to begin to, to work is, is yeah, to embark some clinicians that are open-minded and to uh, use our model. So for example, I have a pediatrician who is a surgeon who, who has been using a, uh, very simple models, indeed, like zero D models that we applied to uh, almost fifty patients, and he got a great publication, the best journal of their field. I mean, um, so I agree. Using simpler model to begin with, probably is a, an entry point. Um, embark more clinicians in the in the loop, and also. Um, um, I think the validation point also is a is a critical point. And for example, in the project uh, where we were together with Giancarlo, to be honest, uh, it was not easy because we thought we would have access to more validating data. So when we were um, simulating a surgery, for example, but eth ethically, it was not. Uh, possible to get the measurements post up that we were needed to, to validate the model. So there is also a sometimes a ethical issue there, which of course depends on the clinical uh, application, but that's, that's a real issue for, uh, for some models. Um, so again, to, to advance on that point, it's, you know, to, to work with clinicians, to see uh, maybe the clinical application that for which is ethical uh, to take this or that measurement. And um, it also depends a lot on the clinical center, what is you know considered uh, routine or not. Or, so I think there is not one answer, but it's, you know, there are a number of factors that we can work on. Um, no, that, I mean, yeah. what you say, it's, uh, it's, it's very reasonable. And uh, I, 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 I think it's, uh, it's, it's a good direction to look at, but then, uh, I mean, just to, let's say, go on with this discussion. And uh, when I hear something like that, uh, as a mathematician, as a person who, I mean, my, I, 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 I think that I, I can give my best in developing 
advanced models, let's say. So as a person who has this skill, I, I, I feel quite uh, worried. But uh, mm -hmm. so the, the, the second question that I would like to, if, uh, I'd like to maybe uh, to, to, to discuss is, so imagine that this is a real, the, 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 the paradigm. So simpler models are e more easily transferred to the clinic. This is obvious, but still it's, it's a statement. Uh, so what's the role mm -hmm. of the most advanced models, which are obviously very visible and very, uh, let's say, e interesting and populating the literature, obviously, uh, probably for a reason. So what's, how is the, let's say, the cascade that goes from the most advanced models for organs, for, I mean, in the vascular, in cancer, in all possible fields, to the simpler models. So in the end, how the complex models, how the advanced models will finally impact on, uh, on the, uh, the final outcome, which is the clinics. Probably, as you say, it's not a direct one-to-one, uh, -one, uh, let's say, connection. There is some intermediate steps. Do you have a vision about that? Um, so, First of all, I think it depends a lot on the clinical application you're targeting. So some of them, maybe a, a good uh, reduce model already exists. For some others, maybe, I mean, it is possible to create a reduce model from, you know, mm. rich models that that can answer uh, faster this, this question. And, and here, machine learning can be an option, for example. Like you do massive, you know, 3D simulation, and then because the the machine learning models they are very quick then to to run. Um, now, see hard flow, for example. I mean, uh, they will. I mean, Charlie Taylor will tell you in in conferences. I mean, I had not worked with them for for years, and and then he he came back to to work with me. But um, he will tell you like uh, the bottleneck for them. It's not the CFD part, it's the image analysis part. Mm. So, um, but, but where the position themselves is, you know, is before the treatment, like you don't need an instant uh, answer. You, they have time to create their report, et cetera. It's, uh, um, so they can use HPC, they don't have to, I mean, their, their simulations are not performed inside the, the clinics, it's outside. So that's another way to tackle the problem is to, um, to, to run, you know, rich models, but for answering questions for which you have a bit more time to, to answer them. Um, and, uh, I think they are the perfect example of, you know, a successful way to yes. make a difference in patients. Um, so I think they are on a good track. I hope it really works because then, you know, it will uh, allow more examples like this to exist. I mean, there are tons of small companies that popped up in the last years uh, in the US or in Europe um, on this kind of subject. So yeah. I hope they will uh, succeed because it will mean that uh, what we did in research has been transferred into a product that can make a difference. Mm. Paolo, I have, uh, if I can, some additional comments. Of course. I, I fully agree with uh, Irene about uh, the, the, the so large gap that exists.